All right, uh, good afternoon. Um, we're gonna get started here. I know we're coming out of a coffee break, hard to herd the cats um, into here, but um, I'm Wes Skeffington. I am a systems architect in our engineering organization at uh, AMD. Um, and today, uh, Mikhail and I are gonna talk to you about um, dynamic board ID and device tree selection that we're doing um, within um, our SOM product family that we call CREA. So, so first I just wanna kinda get some definitions down. Uh, I think most people are going to be um, already familiar with this, but as we get into the subject of why are we doing what we're doing, uh, it's kind of important to understand the hardware modularity um, that we're working towards and that our customers are trying to achieve with the entire sort of system on module concept. And then uh, a layer of this that's impacted by the fact that we're an FPGA SOC, meaning that um, you know a big part of the value we add customers see in our SOCs is that hardware programmability, which then brings us back to some of the complexity in terms of how we want to be able to expose this, that dynamic hardware um, to the, the software system. So first, um, what's shown on the left is, is this idea of a system on module or SOM. Um, we've got a couple examples up here. Uh, this one's got the thermal plate up off of it, but you can think of it as a embedded compute system that's pretty application agnostic. So a lot of customers pick this up because it is uh, application agnostic. So that meaning like the application specific peripherals aren't there on it and those application specific peripherals are introduced through what we call a carrier card with it. So this uh, ad, uh, idea of hardware abstraction is really useful so that when customers that have high diversity in terms of their IO mix, but sort of a common compute need, can achieve that in an efficient way. And an example of that sort of application space would be industrial IO. So, in a factory floor or a power plant, um, you'll have this sort of common compute need, but a huge diversity in terms of the type of uh, I.O. that you need to interface to. And so the way that those customers achieve that is through a SOM and then a carrier card where you bring in all the application-specific I.O., whether that be CAN, whether that be a set of UARTs, a different number of Ethernet ports, um, what have you to it. Um, up here, if we, you want to come up later, you're welcome to. You can see sort of the portfolio. We've got two different SOMs um, up here, and then I've got three different carrier boards uh, as kind of show and tell. So um, kind of the problem statement that we faced when uh, the program was started uh, was how do we manage this? How do we also make it efficient for our customers to manage this mo uh, hardware modularity that we achieve through a, a SOM with a diverse set of carrier cards with then under that a diverse set of PL-based applications that are all mapped into this system. The hardware differences between the SOM and the carrier cards are pretty obvious. You can see that physically in the system. What's unique then as you look down at the FPGA side of it, again, programmable hardware, is that even though a carrier card might have a superset of physical I.O., what a customer decides to implement in the PL can differ based on what application that they're using. And that's kind of what this bottom layer is showing. So um, what we and our customers ultimately want to do in these scenarios where you've got that common compute infrastructure but high diversity uh, physical I.O. is sort of what's the minimum set of firmware that I can do in order to manage and maintain that at a, at a fleet level. And so um, what we tried to do is come up with this scheme that provides an ability for a common firmware to be the basis for booting these systems and then using uh, dynamic device tree overlays by which to be able to deploy and manage these bit streams dynamically on the platform. Now, uh, I w the reason that that dynamic element is so important, I already touched on this being an FPGA SOC, um, is the fact that even once I'm deployed on target, you would say, well, Mr. Customer, once you have this done, once you have your fabric, uh, PL design done, you treat it like a static platform. But most of our customers want to be able to use that FPGA dynamically even in system once they've deployed and align basically that hardware configuration that they're using on the FPGA side of the SOC in different ways. 
in the simplest example, or I'd say the most sort of universal example everyone can relate to, is in an automobile where we've got customers that want to have a certain bitstream loaded when the car is parked. They want a different bitstream loaded when they are in low speed mode, sort of city traffic, and then yet another bitstream loaded when they are on highway mode. And they want to be able to do those switches fast. They want to be able to do it without rebooting Linux. Um, and that's a big part of why this dynamic DT is an important aspect. So with that, I hand it off to Mikhail. OK, I will cover the first part of that means how to boot a system like this, right? Pretty much as was, de as was described, we have a SOMS, we have a different carry cards, and we don't want to exchange firmware all the time when you switch from the one SOM to a different carry cards. That's why we come up with a, with a solution, and before I get to the solution, I, will just, I just need to give you some information, technical details about the hardware, how it works. For us, the system boots out of the boot images, that's called boot bin, you can imagine it like a, like a one container which contains multiple software elements, which is TFA, U-Boot, PMU firmware, that's the firmware for our, for our internal, uh, internal controller, and the U-Boot and DTBs, right? The way how it, how it works from Boudron perspective is when you boot out of, and we are booting out of QSPY on these kind of products, is that Boudron will look at every 32K so, uh, address and try to look for a boot bin. That's the most important information to know that pretty much when you start a system, you have a QSPY boot mode, you start from zero. If there is not a boot bin, then it will lock 32K, right? And 32K offset, then 64K offset, and so on. Based on this functionality, we define an MTD map for that, just to, just to reuse this functionality of the boot ROM, how to boot a system, okay? Based on that, we created a specific MTD partition just to be able to support AB update as well, okay? It means if you take a look at the MTD partition, that we have a software which is called image selector, okay? That's the guy who, who looks at the, at the data, the metadata which are saved in the persistent register space, and we have also backup location for that, and based on the decide if image A is going to boot or image B is going to boot. Pretty much that's something, and we will, we will look at it later, that's pretty much the location which we're going to use for the metadata v version. Okay? It means then this is, the, this is the map which we are using. Okay? And because this is something what is pre-baked when you buy starter kits, that's the software which is already present there, we also wanted to provide the ability to recover the system. That's why this is, this is Titan, and there is another location which is labeled like a, uh, like a recovery image. It means when there is not a functional boot image in the image A or image B partition, you are automatically going to the recovery application. Okay, this is ensured by image selector catch, as you see, image A or image B partition. It means if the image is broken, pretty much boot is keep going, then it catch the partition and it jumps to the recovery image. That's the one way how to get there. Another way is because we have a firmware upgrade bottom. When you come there after that, you can see that there is a bottom. And when this bottom is pressed and then port is power up, then you get also to the recovery application. And this is pretty much just a small uh, standalone application running web server and then you can just load images to AB, AB partition, okay? Just take a look if we forget something. Uh, yes, the last thing, because this is, a, this is a carrier card and the SOM, we need to identify that. We have a different type of SOM, different side of grades, and so on. It means by the spec, what has been developed for that, uh, it's described specific I2C memories, address controllers, and then we are using FRU format for that. It means pretty much every SOM has a FRU information which is saying, I'm this guy, I'm, this revi I'm in this revision, and so on. The same is for carrier card. Okay. Okay, and what we have done, how to boot a system through the boot bin. It means we start image select to find out, okay, I'm image A or image B, and then jumps to it, right? And because we want to use the same image which works for all the combinations, we, look at that and say, okay, how we are going to do it? And the way how we are doing it is 
that we are booting the system with very minimalistic DTB, which is pretty much describing all the common peripherals which needs to be required to identify the system. And when we know which system we are running at, we are switching to the proper device to which describe the combinations. Okay, we have a two type of SOM. One is starter kit, this is pretty much, a, and then we have a production version. The, the main difference is, I mean, it's a different silicon, of course on production versus a production grade silicon, okay? But there is also a different, that there is a, on production one, it's a EMMC. It means pretty much we are booting the system, we don't need EMMC, right? It means we are booting with the device tree which is describing the bare minimal. Then we are looking at the, through the I2C for identification. We do the identification and based on that, we are composing a string, and we are, try we are trying to match the combination, okay? It means we are not using one DTB, but we are using fit image with a set of DTBs for all the combinations which are used, okay? The reason for that is that U-boot, as of today, is not supporting applying DT overlay at this stage. It's supporting only applying DT overlay at the later stage, okay? That's why we did a little bit of trick because if you look at the combination, this is the actual description of the fit image, uh, what we are using. We added a support for the regular expressions. It means I don't want to describe all the SOMS versions and revisions. I don't want to describe all the career card revisions and versions. I just want to use pretty much a regular expression to say, okay, all the revisions from the, I don't know, RevB app can be done by this, okay? It means this is the really how the config fit image looks like, that we have a limited set of DTBs, combined DTBs already. As you see, we are normally using a DT overlay just to merge them together. Then we have a different combination, and the description is using regular expression. It means if you want to take a look how it looks like, this is a combination inside the, inside the U-boot and the description how it looks like. And the way how we are doing it, there is a specific functionality inside the U-boot which is called DTB selection, and that's exactly what we are using. It means boot, detect the system through the I2C, find out combination inside a fit image with the DTBs, and do the DTB reselection. That's what we are using. If you look at the diagram, how it looks like, that we have a different combinations, right? There is a QSPY boot, then there is a board identification through the SOM and carrier card, then we have a different DTBs, and then we are going to U-boot, and U-boot is doing DTB or selection, okay? At this stage, U-boot is fully aware about the version and about the combination when it runs, and then we can start to go and boot operating system. Yeah, so what you, what you can see here is basically we've got an analogous sort of DT management to the physical hardware of, of the system, so that first stage here, of what really happens at power on is representing what we know is always fixed on the SOM itself, and that we know with high degree of reliability or fixed because it's it's fixed by the hardware design. And then um, at the next stage, as, as Mikhail described, right, that's where we identify what carrier card am I plugged into. And so for customers that have that 20 to 30 carrier cards, right, this is a, a method for them to be able to manage that without having unique firmware for each and every one of them. And so that second stage really being analogous to what is the additional hardware now that I see exposed on um, the, the carrier card. So it's, it's the concept of overlays because each stage of hardware is adding incremental hardware um, to the system. And then as we get down to um, the third stage, this is in that uh, earlier slide I was showing where you showed the different apps. This is where um, on target, this is really representative of what's that incremental FPGA based um, hardware that I'm bringing into the system. And these are the pieces of hardware that customers are um, really desiring to be able to dynamically swap without having to uh, reboot Linux in between. Again, that automotive example of park mode, low speed mode, high speed mode um, of operation to that. So, um, you know, some of the key components and, and technical work that's gone into this is the, the U-boot work that Mikhail already touched on. Um, that within our system, our platform management um, software also had to be extended to have this idea of an overlay, so incremental hardware enablement um, to it. Um, 
the decoupled Linux um, and dynamic device tree and loading, as I mentioned down here around the, the FPGA, and two key aspects of that are the uh, FPGA manager library that's you know upstream. We really need to make sure that that's working well um, in upstream. And then our corresponding libdfx that interacts and interfaces to that um, FPGA manager component. And then the Linux DT overlays, obviously. Now, this wasn't entirely smooth sailing. We've learned a few things, and there's some things that we want to continue to work with the upstream community on to um, really uh, make this possible and easy to use for our FPGA um, based customers, which um, one of them, that PL dynamic loading and unloading, we've gotten it to, to work, but we'll honestly say that the load generally works pretty, pretty seamlessly. It's the unload where you find where the driver's not cleaning up after themselves um, with that. So for our drivers, we've worked through that, but I would say it's a learning process each time um, as we, we bring in another hardware driver, PL hardware driver, and make that work. Um, Upstream supportive of DT overlays. So right now, there's uh, we're using Config FS, you know, based uh, you know implementation, and we're really wanting to get feedback and discussion with the community on is that the way we want to do that, you know, forward, uh, looking forward, and what's the proper way for us to enable that in the community with this realization of, of dynamic hardware is a real thing, a real value um, for our customers on that. Um, and uh, again, limited references to, to customers for protection deployments. Just being, this customers have wanted this, but we really haven't had this out there in, in spades, um, so that there's a lot of, of baseline code for them to look at and, and exercise this uh, in this way. I will say, since we've done this, what we've seen a lot of customer, um, I don't wanna say interest, um, a lot of sort of light bulbs go on and say, oh, I didn't know I could do that, but that's really awesome if I can do that. That's super beneficial to me, uh, especially in the embedded systems where you're constrained, you wanna use the smallest device um, possible, because today we're basically forcing customers to you know, buy a bigger device and run everything that they want, that park mode, that slow speed, and that high speed mode all concurrently, which means that they're burning, having to get a bigger FPGA. Our marketing guys would like that, yes, but. Um, reality of from an engineering point of view, you want to be able to time division multiplex that, um, that resource. Um, so just to kind of as we wrap up a little bit, some of the example applications that uh, really we see benefit um, with this and where has some um, taken off and, and being used in sort of this manner that I'm describing um, is the industrial I.O. example I gave where um, if anyone's been in a factory or a power plant, you'll see that they handle these industrial IOs, which can handle, um, you know, there's different DACs, they're different ADCs, they're different physical interfaces um, in terms of how I bring those in. So as an owner of, you know, just that hardware product, you end up with a huge diversity in terms of physical hardware you have to build just to accommodate all that. So again, that's a place where uh, folks have seen that. Uh, industrial controllers, um, a scenario too here where industrial controllers just like our generalized compute, I always think of them in t-shirt sizes. You have small, medium, large, depending on what you want. And that's sort of what we're accomplishing too here between like our, our K26 SOM, which is a you know, bigger, more powerful versus our K24. And so that plugability within that hardware architecture to have sort of that small, medium, uh, large compute capability is, is hugely beneficial for those. Um, healthcare. Uh, so. Uh, some of the customers here picking this up are uh, in the healthcare market doing uh, surgical robotics, things like that. Um, where also, again, they see that plugability as being um, hugely advantageous uh, just because of the analogy it brings in terms of the modularity, both in, in hardware and software, um, that they can do. So, um, and then I already kind of touched on the dynamic uh, platforms for reuse um, in it. So. Uh, not only, again, the reduced design artifact development and maintenance, but uh, life cycle costs, shared updates. Um, so just bringing in the OTA aspect of that, too, that's why they want to manage those bit streams, too, is not boot time firmware, but is something that's just something they can manage as a, in the file system of, of Linux. So then when they do have bit stream updates, they're not having to push a firmware update, which is what you would really do 10 years ago, but being able just to just deploy that um, you know, dynamically as a, a package into uh, the Linux runtime system. And then uh, faster time to market. Again, since they're not having to start from scratch and do a chip down design, a lot of the customers we've seen um, 
especially like in the smart cam area, um, rapidly going to, to market because they can focus on a much simpler base card design and not worry about things like DDR layout. So lastly, as, as we look at next steps, I um, already mentioned the, the collaboration with the, the Linux community. I think sort of the FPGA SOCs are a little bit special in the sense of how much value DT overlays bring. They're, they're really uh, instrumental um, for these type of SOCs and the way our customers want to, to use them. Um, we've done uh, a lot of work with Canonical around Ubuntu, just using them both for um, uh, sort of a, a dual path. We've got some customers that want embedded Linux, which we've got all running and stood up in, in the Octo, and then another path where customers that want sort of an off-the-shelf distro, and that's where, you know, they're picking up and using uh, Ubuntu as a starting point. Um, and this is where, you know, some of the work we've done on the library, I mentioned LibDFX and then DFX Manager, which is another user space library uh, that stands on top of that, um, you know, getting that up into the Ubuntu archive and working with them on it um, to that. Um, as we look at some of the drivers, also DKMS is really important because those FPGA um, libraries, by, they're dynamic by uh, their very definition which means our customers can create their own custom hardware, which then they're going to create their own custom uh, driver with it, which means it's not always upstream immediately. And so DKMS and being able to handle drivers in that way is, is another important thing that, again, looking for best practices from the community here um, on it. Um, what we're trying to do with Lenaro, I already mentioned those uh, base pieces that are really application agnostic for dealing with the hardware dynamically, putting that into some of the one lab and the TRS work is what we want to do in the next year. Um, the loading and unloading, I already mentioned um, to it. Uh, we're working system ready, so KV260, which is uh, this unit here, um, is already in uh, the one lab and uh, going through that system ready uh, certification process uh, to it. Um, DTP fit, fit generation and then the AP, AB um, uh, update. So Korea, we launched before the, the ARM spec was out and we did that AB update, but it's very analogous to what the ARM spec calls out. The next CREA that we do will be 100% aligned with that out the door uh, with the you know, MV uh, uh, data too uh, with it. So that's our last slides. Thank you all for uh, your time and attention, and if there's any questions, let us know. Hey. Um so uh, one of the questions that I had, like specifically on like on, on the DT loading, when you're you know like using uh, fit images, is easy to just add all the DTBs in there and so on and so forth, and then select a runtime and then apply you know like uh, uh, the overlays and so on. But what about then on the kind of the generic uh, boot path scenario, like for example system ready, you know like booting for example from U boot to an EFI, and then you know, like uh, you 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 don't have fit image support at that point, right? So how how you're Kind of dealing with that have, scenario. We have, we have. It's already there, right? It means pretty much what is going for the system where they are certification is that combined DTB. Okay, so you're doing that before. Also, we're in a little bit the UFI yeah, it's, payload. It's, you even didn't get it to the U-boot prompt, and you yeah. are, you have the right combination, the right identification. Okay. That's why the DTB yeah. or selection it's is the, is the key part of it because it's just happening very very early. Ah, okay, cool. It means you simply, you really have no chance, user have no chance just to just to do any folder. It, if the combination is just supported, you just get to the full system. And because if you look at that, right, it's the SOL. Yep. Right? It's nothing, right? If you look at a carrier card, you have an Ethernet, USB, and so on, right? It means when you get to the U-boot prom, you have all the IPs already present. You can use the HCP, you can use all the things. It's just happening before before anybody gets to the U-boot prom. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, maybe we didn't clarify well is that when we make that DT switch or reselection in, in the U-boot is uh, we really differentiate because if you look at the physical peripherals and, and our SOCs, you'll see that the, we can kind of split it in half where some of the peripherals are hardened and related to the PS and those are, are fixed and those are what basically U-boot goes and turns on at uh, device tree selection of, of the U-boot stage. And then some set of the, the physical peripherals are PL, which are handled later after Linux boots. But to Mikhail's point, basically after that selection has happened, all the PS peripherals are enabled and ready to go. Yeah, there is a one thing which, uh, which we, we didn't mention, right? It's not about DTB reselection. It's also what is inside the DTs, right? It means what it is happening, it's a pin maxing. It's a communication with the PMU firmware just to enable power domain for that IPs. That's what it is happening underneath as well, right? Because we can't really, we have no idea which 
that SOM is plugged to what card? It means it can be one of one, one of one of ours, which is supported, or it can be completely different. It means all the MIOs are pretty much set up to the GPIO input. Stop it. Uh, and and we don't know. They can't be connected, right? It means pretty much that's the default configuration of the power up, which is GPIO in, right? We find out where we are, and because I2C is under spec, we know, okay, some MIOs are really I2C. That's where we are expecting. So if we are not able just to identify current card, we are staying with the SOM itself, right? It means you get it pretty much as a serial line, okay? And when we, when we know where we are, then we are applying DT, and from the DT we are getting information about the pin control, about all the settings, about power domains, reset, clocks, everything. Yeah, and that, that PMU-based uh, uh, reselection, or again, I call it a PMU overlay, is really a, a feature that a lot of our customers have liked because now it looks more like a hardened uh, SOC with those set of quote-unquote fixed peripherals, at least that's how they experience it. So for our software developers, you know, five years ago, they would have to jump into our configuration tool in order to s define those selectable MIOs. Here, we, we, we've got that overlay I concept, and so they can basically skip that step entirely, so. <laughs> Where's the... Um EEPROM memory that you interrogate to find out which carrier board you uh, have. On I2C. It's I2C. Yes, mm -hmm. But where it is? Is it on a carrier or? It's on both. So there's e each board of incremental hardware has its own EEPROM. Um, on a common configuration I2C bus that gets extended across the, the SOM to carrier card. So there's one physical EEPROM on the SOM that says, hey, I'm a K26 or I'm a K24. Um, and then on the carrier card, its own EEPROM that says I'm a KV carrier or KR carrier or what have you. So they are always at the same address? Yes, that's, that's part of our hardware spec is that they are at fixed addresses. So. I just commented that the EEPROM flashes are at the same addresses. On the yeah, and the format bus. which we are using for the EEPROM is FRU. And the reason why we choose FRU is pretty much long-term history uh, with the FMC standard and FRU is the part of the FMC standard, and, and Xilinx is using FMC connector for quite a while. It means we can pretty much reuse the same code with additional FMC cards. And we're actually using an upstream through read library to do that, so. <laughs> and what about the FPGA identification? How do you know how it was programmed? So, so the, there's two aspects to it. So by nature of the, the physical, um, FPGA, there's a silicon ID, but we already know that based on I'm a K26. We can uh, know what it is there. But then when we're loading the FPGA, I think is your question, after I've loaded an FPGA. So um, that's part of the function that the DFX manager, it's a daemon, so it's keeping track of what's, what's loaded. Um, and in future devices, we've got a capability where we've added, um, we call it a, uh, FID, so functional identification, so then we can maintain basically what's actively loaded and what the corresponding hardware configuration is. Uh, if, you can, if you can go on the last slide. Uh, yeah, uh, can you elaborate on the second last point about uh, the FIT generation uh, via Binman but without placing the nodes? Right. Right now, if you, if you look, all that code is upstream, right? The only thing what is not really upstream is really the combination, how to generate really the fit image with the DTBs. And that's kind of pain point, right? Pain, 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 painful point. Uh, that's why we want to pretty much automate it, because there are device trees, all the device trees for the SOMs are there, for all the DT overlays for the carrier cards are there, right? But we are just not merging them together. Right? That's, that's pretty much just say, it means you build a U-boot and after that you need to run right now some, some scripts just to combine them together. That's pretty much what we have externally. That's what MetaTRS, for example, has. And, and we don't want to really track that, right? I mean, the only way to go is pretty much just to run a make, get all the images out of it, because then there is a new, new carrier card, we don't need to really talk to them. We will, just, we will just test that once, and they will get it after make, they will get everything for free. That's what we want to do. And the reason why not bin man, it's because of system ready, right? 
because Binman is right now, how it is implemented inside the boot is a pretty much device P node inside the DT, which is something what we shouldn't have because it can't really pass the DT schema checking, right? Because it's just not described there. It means putting a Binman to the DT is something what everybody is using right now, but it's completely wrong solution, right? It's simply how Simon Glass started to do so and everybody copied it. But it shouldn't be really like that. It means binman description and all the images and all the generation for that should be really separated. It can be a DDB format, but it shouldn't really end on the target system. That's why it's described like that. All right, I think we're, we're at time. Um, if any, is there any one last question? Okay, if not, thank you everyone. Um, again, there's some hardware up here, show and tell if you want to take a look at it before we wrap up, but thank you.